Hi, Maddie. Good morning. Good morning, Daniel. Uh, it's so nice to get a chance to speak with you. And um, I'm always amazed how long we actually go back. Um, and I sometimes would love to hear from your perspective, like if you still remember that long haired hippie in the white VW van with Spanish number plates showing up at East Mion um, when East yeah. Mion was still relatively young, the sustainability. Yeah. Center, and then um, watching me at Schumacher College be rather heady and during my PhD, you know, I don't know, at, at some point I'd love to get a mirror from you, but I'm, I'm get already getting carried away because we look, know, know each other so, so long. Um, I, I, one question that I normally start this with is, is a question to invite people to reflect a bit on the journey of finding your calling, like your sort of um, that as the Sufis like to call it, what's written on the back of your heart, the the sort of, how, how did you find out what Maddie Harland was supposed to gift to the world and, and so wonderfully do it? Um, I wouldn't say I ever found out what I, what I was directly going to gift, but I had a, a number of experiences that showed me where my heart really lay so so when I was young I grew up in in London uh, with three brothers but every summer for quite a few years we'd be packed into the car all six of us with mum and dad and we would drive and then catch a ferry right out on to the west coast of Ireland into Connemara where they were still speaking Gaelic and we would go fishing because my, my brothers were much older than me and quite wild and it was a very good way to entertain them for three weeks um, to, to get us all out on boats and, and we'd be fishing and uh, sometimes my mum and I would you know land on little islands and uh, this was on a loch called Loch Corrib, um, a really ancient place. There's St Patrick's Helmsman's headstone on one of the islands that's sixth century so very ancient Celtic place very atmospheric and we used to land on on islands and make fires and brew tea and and it was just completely no other tourists okay very few Germans no English because of the troubles um but because my father was Irish we kind of got away with going there really um and I loved the wilderness from a, the age of four or five I just loved it with a passion and I loved building fires and being outdoors and being in the weather and on boats, it just became an absolute passion. And then um, before Tim and I had kids, uh, when we were in our late twenties, we, um, we thought, right, we're gonna do one more adventure before we have kids. <laughs> have the and, real adventure. <laughs> yeah, so we went to um, Baja, Mexico, to the lagoons where the grey whales breed and rear their young. And um, again, I was on a small boat, a skiff out in the lagoon um, and a very controlled environment. You were only allowed a certain amount of boats in San Ignacio Lagoon. Um, because you mustn't trouble the the young calves and so I was sitting in this small skiff and they gave me the helm because I don't know it's in your DNA when you grow up with boats so I took the home helm and they used to say you know the friendlies you can't ever find in the lagoon the mother and the calves they they only come to you if if they want to and that's the same with spirit bears in in the great bear rainforest they they'll come to certain trackers but not and, you know you call them basically with your heart and they they came to me so they always used to give me the helm every time we went out every day on the boats and one time um there was a mother in a calf really near to us and the calf dove under the boat 
and and because it was a baby it sort of slightly knocked the boat and there was lots of our fellow um guests on the boat taking pictures but because i was on the helm i was just like in the moment no no camera and and i lent to steady myself on the outboard motor and as i lent over i just the, the baby came up and literally within three three foot a meter uh, at, at the most i saw its eye and it was so ancient and i thought my god this is a sentient ancient being that has a consciousness far older than mine and it was just an absolute moment of um recognition of the sentient nature of our more than human friends and that i lived in this unbelievable animate planet so beautiful um and i whew, it to this day it deeply touches me and I thought I've got to devote the rest of my life to doing whatever I can to um, you know not even conserve um, but or preserve but but you know I've got to dedicate myself to the well-being of this planet and all of my relations and that was kind of the moment wow I, that's thank you so much for, for sharing that because that that makes me more connected um with you because for me it's also been marine mammals that that kind of opened the the door um into being in relationship in a much much deeper way with with the more than human world um because it, like you were saying, that they only come to you. I mean, they, they hear you long before you could even know whether they're in the area. Um, and I, I've like for a while, I was um, not just a marine biologist, but also like a, a, a I took people out on swim with the dolphin um, excursions in New Zealand um, in, in my year out between school and, and university. And one, one thing that you can do is if, you, if you're in the water with them and you sing into the snorkel, they, they love the singing and, and, and they get interested. And then, they, then they can, the, you can actually get the school to come closer to you. And it's, uh, but yeah, that, there's something amazing about looking into a marine mammal's eyes. Um, and exactly as you said, the, it's just because they've chosen to live without anything what we celebrate our achievements on like technology and things yeah, doesn't mean that they're not perceiving this world with a, with, with a level of um, nuance and and um, perception that yeah. we might not even be <laughs> comprehending well yeah. I don't think we do and yeah. and you know they have very sophisticated language they have incredibly um sophisticated community bonds and and you know they they're just incredible beings really and i think you know i was brought up hunting and fishing as they mm -hmm. say and and so i i mean i do remember my father telling off my brother for killing a trout in a in an undignified way that was mm -hmm. deep you know, early memory that he was really cross with him because you're meant to dispatch with efficient sort of compassion in an odd way and then eat it. Um, so I did, we did have standards in our hunting and fishing upbringing, but uh, this this moment was, yeah, just an, a real appreciation of this large wet brained mammal and, and it's not only its intel intelligence, but how that lineage is, is so ancient and they carry the lineage of ancient intelligence. Yeah, like, and you, you another, and another story that, like, that I feel moved to share was um, 
in my first year at university, I, I um, organized, like I, another friend of mine in, in my same year of biology was also into marine mammals. So we en ended up going to Inverness to the European Cetacean Society conference um, that happened to be in Scotland that year. And, and, and spent three days at this conference as like um, undergraduate first years, um, which was quite unusual to already go to conferences and ended up finding out that there was this Norwegian, like Mexican, a Mexican guy in Norway with a bunch of Norwegians um, team that was doing research on Orkinos orca, on, on what people call killer whales. And um, they were complaining that all their research time is in the middle of the winter when the, and they're up north of Narwick. So um, they only have a very li limited amount of time where it's even dim light. You don't see the sun come above the horizon there, but, but it's dim enough to be out on the fjord and, and observe the, 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 the super pots that form there. They, they come like lots of different pots come together in these fjords because there's lots of herring there. Mm -hmm. And um, we had this idea of asking Pilkinton Optronics, to, which, which make night sites for the, for the military, to lend us one of their night sites and then go and try to extend their study season with them. So just on that idea, we ended up getting funding to go to Norway, the two of us, and, and spent three weeks with this research team observing killer whales in midwinter. And um, being on the on the fjord when, when they do carousel feeding, they swim around the herring until the herring becomes so tight that tightly herded into one little ball that on the, on the surface, it looks like a circle of boiling water. The, the, yeah. the herring are jumping because they, they try to get away. And as the, the whales swim around, they flick their, their tails. And because they have so much power, they make the oxygen go out of um, solution in the water and it actually creates a sonic bang that, that bursts the swim bladders of the herring in that tightly packed ball. And then some of them sort of dive, like they're all swimming in circles around it. And then one or two of them just break out and scoop up the herring that is floating around um, stunned. And, it's, it's just the, the level of intricacy of that feeding behavior and, and the way they communicate and team up and the like listening. Also, I remember one morning being out really early, it was still dark and, and the, the water was completely flat and you could hear nothing because it's that stillness of snow everywhere. And we had a hydrophone listening to them underwater. So that was, super busy in, in one year and then every now and then you would hear them come up and you hear that I know board. that oh. that fishy yeah. that fishy breath yeah. it's it's just an amazing sound yeah no yeah. anyway like I don't know why I went into that but but yeah that's so I didn't know that you had that that kind of yeah um, that, that was you you know mackerel do that as well yeah. with sprats they 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 mm -hmm. heard them in into a an estuary or a bay mm -hmm. and then they have it go into a feeding frenzy and it, it's like the whole it's a bit like when you see birds murmurations mm -hmm. uh, murmurating in the sky mm -hmm. it's like the whole of nature just becomes absolutely imbued with with extraordinary energy and and you can't help absorbing the the the, the high of of when you're watching that kind of experience it's just unworldly it you know it's amazing it's better than i don't know i've i've never been a a, a particular class a drunk <laughs> <laughs> but for me that yeah. that is the sort of ultimate um ecstasy and i get that with with bees when they swarm when, when are you we, a beekeeper, aren't you? I am a beekeeper. Oh. And I'm a, I'm a slightly obsessive swarm catcher as well. Um, and when bees swarm, they, they, they fan out the pheromone to tell all of their colony where to go and where the queen is. And it has the most extraordinary perfumed scent. And it's, it's slightly, well, no, it's not even slightly, it's euphoric. And, and but also for us humans or just for them? 
don't know for me oh. and, <laughs> and when you when you're in the middle of a swarm mm -hmm. um, they've gorged lots of honey so they don't sting they're not unless they've been out for a few days and have consumed their honey uh, um, but mainly swarms are completely docile they're just comp they're you know they're just focusing intently on where to go next and sending the signals and so you get covered in the pheromone and it and it smells it it's like on it's heavenly mm. and and the, it's, it literally is an incredible buzz catching 30,000 honeybees or you, you don't catch them they they choose where they're going to go you just create the um, environment that they want to be in Really. So, so you you actually go how how does that process work? Like you you you, you use a hive box to yeah you, track you, them into it. Or? You make um well you can either use just a, a you know a small um, hive um, or you can make what you call a bait box, which is slightly smaller mm -hmm. than a, than a beehive, and you put a couple of old frames in that smells of bees that where the wax has been drawn out uh, and you put lemon grass at the entrance and inside the hive because it mimics the pheromone lemon um, grass. Bees. Oh. yeah so you put it in and you just you leave the the box uh, in wherever you think we, we've got a particular tree in our garden it's a medlar tree that the bees like like to go to we also catch them in our front garden and um i have filmed all this it's on our permaculture magazine youtube channel oh cool i will i have a b i have a b section that's pure self-indulgence brilliant i will look look at it i didn't know that <laughs> and uh so we we bait the hive with um lemongrass and we wait and and then when they come, we, we usually go and film them because it's, and we also just like to be in the middle of this extraordinary, it's like, it's like a, I imagine being in the middle of a bird's murmuration or a, a shoal of um, mackerel chasing sprat. I mean, it's just another of these natural experiences that is, is very ecstatic. I really, I really want. I mean, I've got a lot, lot of what I would like to do now with having just yes. be, become. Um, yes, I've been watching by you. A piece of land, but I've been but I, you. I, I, I would love to learn how to beekeep. Um, oh, but it, it, it's it, intuitive. It, because you mentioned the murmuration, I like the the other day we were standing on the land and it's it's a um, it's part of a hill, mm. and so. Um, we actually, like it was Alice, Lucia and I standing on this open field and suddenly we had a, a part, like one arm of a murmuration, not, not the whole murmuration, scoop above that hill hilltop that we were standing on. And they were only maybe eight, nine meters above us. And suddenly the, the sky went literally darker because there were so many birds, um, starlings flying above our head. It were, and, and you should have seen Lucia's eyes. She's like, Sort of, and just stood there in complete awe. Isn't it wonderful yeah. to, when children do do that? Yeah. We took our our youngest, who was must have been about, I, oh, I, I ought to know exactly, uh, about seven. We took her to a total eclipse of of the sun in mm -hmm. Cornwall. Um, I think it was something like 1999 or something. I remember that eclipse. I was yeah. a mother, yeah. and she was. Like saucer like eyes in absolute wonder um of of the of the cosmos mm -hmm. she was so she said why didn't you tell me it was going to be like this and well how could we it was the first eclipse of the sun we did you know but literally the whole world went dark and all the seabirds came in to roost and it became unnaturally quiet and and darkness fell i mean it was apocalyptic i can understand why ancient people so revered that experience it was, it was wonderful and the the ch our children were so entranced by it and she actually went on to become a marine and natural history photographer um I professionally um and won awards and, and, and stuff as well. Well, yeah. 
she did she yeah she got a first so she did well but um but i i really feel like um that moment was one of those moments for her as uh, you know formative moments in her life yeah i i, I just thought of something because you like the the lemongrass thing doesn't go out of my head and you and that reminds me of something you said earlier which i thought also wanted to highlight because you said like to heal nature not necessarily to conserve or preserve it and and it's yes. something that that i would also like i love to hear you speak about because we're now finally having a conversation about rewilding Here but we are. we're having a conversation about rewilding that is perpetuating the the false dualism between nature and culture um yes. it is and the same as there are still to this state unfortunately many of our good friends in the kind of conservation and preservation of nature protect nature protect this eh, world that haven't to my mind fully clicked on the fact that everything is on the move everything is always on the move but now that we started this unraveling of the, the global climate system, cli climate zones, um, species distribution, migration patterns, um, entire species dying that used to be the basis of one part of the migratory chain of other insects or birds. Or, so it's all on the move. So the whole idea that we can preserve or um, conserve, that we can protect ecosystems in their pristine state as if they ever stopped. Um, we just saw them in one of their blimps in a long, long journey. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear you speak a little bit about this, this dynamic. And because lemongrass, as far as I understand, is, is, is an um, Asian plant. So how interesting that bee beekeepers in Europe figure out that an Asian plant can help you become a positive healing influence in an ecosystem by working with bees and providing pollinators in an area where, where they might otherwise not be. Um, so, so how do you, like from the whole thing of us as humble co-designers of dynamic ecosystems? Well, I think that's the essence, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's like when, when you want to put a fence some, around something and conserve it, you're you're immediately saying that we humans don't belong in this space mm -hmm. you're immediately separating us from nature and yet for me all my deepest happiness comes from being in nature so already that there's this tension that we don't belong and it is like a biblical alienation from the Garden of Eden, that we're shamed and we must leave. So I think that, and I think that unconsciously is deeply under, you know, deeply woven into Western culture, that, that somehow we, you know, we can't be in, in nature. And, and so the, the rise of, people of the land who are trying to um, go into co-design, co-sentience with nature is the another cultural swelling uh, um, and expression. And then with rewilding, we think that it, we, we're just going to leave it alone and, and then it'll fix itself. And of course, over decades and decades, that's you know, we have natural succession and the brambles will turn into to, um, pioneer trees and eventually we'll get our climax species and there will be some kind of restoration. But we also then, know- then it goes back into the cycle of breakdown. Yeah, of course because, it does, because then, in, then in the, the climax peak ecosystem tree, doesn't stay peak the whole time. No, never, <laughs> because it, the climax tree will fall in the, the great storm and the brambles will grow up beneath it and the deer will come and eat the brambles. But the thing about rewilding is that it, it isn't rewilding because we know things like the NEP estate they're highly managed systems. You know, they're, yes, they're bringing in stalks and, and 
species, but they're creating habitat. And, and a lot of the rewilding projects are actually about intervention. But when you start looking at regenerative systems, we, we know that we, first of all, yes, we've lost some of our keystone species. So we can't, you know, we don't have in many places the lynx and the wolf. Mm -hmm. So we have too many deer, too many rabbits. Um, so, so the human beings have to become the predators in that system to keep it in balance. We also know from permaculture design and regenerative agriculture that when we, when we do intervene, within an ecosystem in, in intelligent and strategic ways, we can actually create regeneration at a vastly faster speed than natural succession. So um, over two decades ago now, we got hold of a bare piece of land that was plowed and uh, drenched in, um, nitrates and fertilizers and weed killers and we brought it back uh, into a wildflower meadow and then planted a forest garden there and and just from that experience we could see that if we'd left it to just rewild it, it wouldn't have bounced so fast but because we intervened and we sowed the chalk downland uh, wildflower seed that were is part of this landscape and, and we created shelter belts and habitat. It meant that the, the mammals and the insects came in and the reptiles came in at a far faster rate to regenerate. And then because it was a permac it is a permaculture garden, we too could create all those habitats, um, create the biodiversity with nature and eat too. And so it worries me that we're talking about rewilding because there are vast tracts of land, particularly in this country, um, from in the UK, that are good as pasture. And when they're managed sensitively in an organic regenerative system, they, they are, are cropped by domesticated animals and then you take them off and you allow this, the, the, the flowers to come and then you get all the pollinators and the insects and they then feed the bats and the, and the bees um, and, and sorry not the bees the, the birds and, and then you have the pre, you know the higher uh, predatory birds feeding on the songbirds and you know the whole ecosystem blooms um, from those those areas of management and humans dare I say yeah I mean it, too it's it's like sometimes I'm, I'm seeing it now with this piece of land that adopted me the I don't think it's projection I think it what I'm hearing from that land and what I've been doing since we we started working with it um is actually a lot of cutting out dead wood and and it helping to comp bringing things to a place so i can compost yeah. building soil and um, exactly. sometimes i'm streaming stuff down and i look at the and i kind of go ah oh, what have i done but 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 it is i know it's going to help in the long run and yeah. what i'm building is a system that will need none of those interventions, but I need to put the energy in, in yes. the beginning. The same is like, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at certain things and I see shifts in the landscape, subtle like mm. ditches, like to catch water, mm. more water holding capacity in the ground, mm. like contour lines, swales, just subtle interventions, but they still mean getting a digger in um, yeah. or 20 friends with shovels yeah. for a couple of days. Um, and, and that's a lot of energy, but that energy is almost like an acupuncture needle over th 300 years. Yeah? Exactly. But, 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 but it's important to do it. And, yes. and, and I think we human beings have that capacity of making these, even th there will be a moment where it looks brutal because there's like, you've brought in the digger and there's just 
bare earth and you shifted mm -hmm. a heap there and dug mm -hmm. a trench there. But then in the long run, um, you're actually bringing back a diversity of mm -hmm. life and the capacity of that landscape to hold water and and like you're literally planting water. Like I, I plan to do a little bit of irrigation in the next three to five years, but with the vision of building a system that doesn't need any irrigation. Uh -huh. and, and that's, and, and of course, you know, it, where you are is an arid climate, it's quite brittle, mm -hmm. and therefore you, you need to design in irrigation because you will have less rainfall in, in 20 years time than you do now. Mm -hmm. So I have a friend who's doing very similar on a farm scale in, in uh, Tuscany, Northern Tuscany, where he's um, creating all sorts of water harvesting systems. And also it's a, it was a, like a derelict abandoned farm. Mm -hmm. He's also uncovering um, the ancestry of the farm and all the terracing and all the systems that, that the farmers have had on that land many years ago. So it's kind of a combination of the observation of traditional wisdom and understanding of the land with that permaculture dimension of, of capturing water in swales or, you know, ditches on the contour and, and all of that, that wisdom that, that is out there in the regenerative land care movement so it's a sort of old and new technology it, it's another fascinating bit that relates to what we're talking about with regard to preservation conservation and and, mm. and how do you preserve or conserve a dynamic transforming nested wholeness that is constantly in in flux um, and yeah. which is which is how life sustains life and, and generates conditions conducive to life so um but it, it but it is interesting where do you put your traditional system, uh, like the piece of land that, that, that um, I'm working with is has a an old era, which is where in a very large wheat field that used to be there maybe 100 years ago, um, they brought all the, the stones to that one circle and built a threshing platform out of it. So where they could separate the wheat from the chaff because there's a bit of wind in that spot. Mm. And um, it's also because everything else was planted. Traditionally, the era was the place that any kind of shelling or mm. working together took place. Lovely. So it's a, it's a magic place. It's the mm. literally the place where the, the farm or the, the, the land people worked together mm. because the other place was for growing. And so I, I want to use that also as a power spot, anchoring into the traditions for mm. as, as a council circle. Mm. But, as I was working, sort of slowly uncovering it, I also thought, yeah, but what was there before that, before they had their farm? Mm. And maybe that farming was already the first wrong intervention in the sense of they were tilling, they were beginning a process of mm. slow erosion as well. And at the same time, they built 20,000 um, kilometers of dry stone walling in the mountains that slowed down erosion and, and build a richer system today than there would have been without human intervention. So, so it, it just shows how even that blend of nature and culture over hundreds of years um, transforms landscapes. Britain's dry stone walls that separate this tapestry of, of very diverse landscape in the, in the, in the southeast where you are. Um, yeah, like how how do we also make peace with traditional farming techniques and traditional knowledge of the land and find a nuanced way of understanding this is true wisdom of place where they've really tuned into how this land wants to be worked and have done so for many generations. And then where my... Like, because really the, the, the very destructive farming came in with chemical agriculture and only in the last 60 to 100 years. And yeah, it's supposed to all repurposing of yeah. chemistry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, po really post war, exactly. Like, mm. it was all the, 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 the chemistry that didn't go into bombs anymore, becoming exactly. bombing our fields. Absolutely. Yeah. We bomb nature instead. Yeah. But anyway, like, this, this dynamic. I mean, that's that permaculture is they, that, that's also one thing that I think 
people who focus very much on their sort of site design um, mm -hmm. can get the wrong idea that that site design would ever be finished at any point in time. No, because it's just constantly ev evolving, constantly. Um, and the other thing I would like to say about rewilding um, is that there is, there is, of course, a place for it. But we also need to look at how we how we also fit in, in nature. And we also have to look at the big picture of what we're eating and what we're importing. And, you know, all of those um, all of those quite controversial arguments about around sustainability and diet and nutrition and what's best for the planet and and it's complicated there isn't you know we humans have a tendency to want very simple equations mm. and and it's not simple mm. so so i think it's it is about finding a balance and i mean in you mentioned permaculture and in permaculture design of course we have zoning so we have five zones and zone five is wilderness it's the place where we don't intervene it's the place where we just you know in every design we should have an area where we just don't interfere and we let let it be um and the bigger the the land holding the more you can do that um, How has your journey into permaculture, where, where did it start? Like, I mean, you, you shared earlier at the beginning, the moment where you felt this is yeah. I now know my calling, How, but then at some point on that journey, you discovered that there's a healing art of yes. landscape restoration and regeneration that is called permaculture that comes from the Aborigines. Um, it does, and, it does. So, so um, we saw a film that many, many people saw um, around 1990 called In Grave Danger of Falling Food. Mm -hmm. And it was Bill Mollison. Um, around the same time, it was such an interesting dichotomy. We also um, saw another visionary film, which was Joseph Campbell and the Power of Myth. And, and strangely, these two, they were part of a series on Channel 4 called Visionaries. And strangely, these two sort of intertwined in our, our own evolution um working on, i think working on different parts of our brains really um but so around 1990 we saw in grave danger of falling food and we were really into into conservation at the time and wildflower meadows and um th that uh, approach and and it was kind of again it was a bit of a kind of light bulb moment where we thought hey hang on a minute we belong and we can have our wildflowers and our habitats and our species diversity, and we can have permaculture and, and have a, a, a designed approach to low impact living at that time. That's kind of how it was framed. And then over the years, it, you, you hit the nail on the head. You know, at that time we weren't really taught permaculture in, with that deep respect to the indigenous worldview. And over the years, I, the more I read and the more I did my own stuff on my own land, I, I began to see how really the essence of permaculture and all of its values are so connected with, with um, First Nation culture and that reverence for the land as, a sentient, sentient and animate and those planting systems, you know, the food forest systems, uh, like going to see Christopher Nesbitt in Belize and him saying to me, you know, my, my teacher and the gold standard food forest uh, was his Mayan neighbor who, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, who taught him everything he knew. And, and just kind of absorbing that. And, and my beekeeping teacher had been keeping bees for about 50 odd years mm -hmm. since he was a boy or longer now. Um, and just having a, a much more respectful understanding of the ancestry of permaculture, 
which is not still not acknowledged and respected in in my view adequately um, as you know a really very much Bill Mollison got it from Aboriginal people that he he was studying and hanging I, out with. One one thing, like I've had some really lovely conversations lately with, with Albert Bates, but also with, with Declan Kennedy. And Declan mm. tells a story that when he was already 48 um, and he was a professor for urban studies at the Technical University of Berlin and starting to kind of feel a little bit in the wheel of how much longer am I going to do the same thing in, in this institution? That's when he heard of um, Bill Mollison's work in Australia and took a year out um, to do a sort of study trip down there. And, um, and really, David Holmgren had just done a master's thesis where he had intentionally abstracted the systemic knowledge that he had learned through contact with indigenous people, um, Aborigines in Australia, into a, a sort of system science or, or, or practical systems design language that created the principles and, and, and all that. And, and he had the, the deep wisdom, the, this is how, how Declan tells the story, the deep wisdom of understanding that he was just a young, young one in, in his 20s and that He'd learned a lot from Bill Mollison doing this work, but he'd done the work and he'd learned a lot, a hell of a lot from in, indigenous um, knowledge influencing this work. And he literally decided that, that Bill was the better person because older, more experienced, more, more, more connected to take this work into the world and, and focused on just doing his thing for, for, for many years. Um, and I fi find that really, interesting because it, it just shows that from the very beginning um it's a it was really intended as a selfless translation of a gift that our only like the the the, the part of the human family that has the longest deepest taproot into our collective common ground which is that we're all indigenous to life because let's not make this stupid dualism between all oh, indigenous and not um, indigenous in order to separate again, because what we're trying to do is bring together. And, they, and they, I've, I find there's been a recently a lot of critique of, of permaculture and, and regenerative uh, development and regenerative design as the white man's appropriation of indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, you could just flip that in an instance, like one of those Kuhnian design, you can see it that negatively, or you can see it finally a language and a wisdom arriving into a misguided part of our species that where now people are waking up and trying to honor and hold that deep knowledge of how to be in right relationship. And that's really what it's all about. And that's what permaculture was all about from the beginning. It might've not been yeah. taught that way for many years, which is a well, shame. Uh -huh. I think we're we're beginning to understand that and and change that, and that's yes. certainly my hope that we are. But uh, that's why I mentioned my my beekeeper um, because he's a, a local Hampshire person that's just you know often says if I phone him up and I there's something I don't understand he he just says just don't interfere you know the bees know what they're doing you very rarely need to. Um, do any intervention you know the worst thing that beekeepers can do is interfere too much mm. you know let the bees get on with it they're intelligent they know how to do it but I think the problem comes Daniel from this deep deep uh, wounding that that we've we've done to other human beings and um, and a, a terrible blindness to our our privilege and I think the the debate and the critique of permaculture has, has come from a sense of not honoring the ancestors of permaculture, which mm -hmm. are First Nation people and not respecting. And, and also the, the cultural history of, of what white people did mm -hmm. to the other, you know, in, in sense of taking all the land and, 
taking children away from their parents and banning language. And we did the same, you know, the English did the same in Ireland. You know, you could say that the Irish people were the Andenu and, and the English colonialists went over then. That's how we learned to do it so well. And then we did it around the world with, with, our, with our empire and as did Spain and Portugal and Germany and the Netherlands and most of the other um, European Western nations. So I, I just think this conversation is part of a truth and reconciliation and, and a rebalancing of respect. And, and, and us, I mean, I'm fascinated by the story that when, when um, Europeans first went to uh, Australia, they couldn't see any of the indigenous uh, agriculture, Aboriginal ag agriculture at all. They just saw wilderness mm -hmm. because their eyes couldn't understand that form of, uh, even then, you know, pre- industrialized agriculture they couldn't understand the how the landscape was tended and 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 farmed and harvested from because it wasn't their cultural metaphor at all so um that fascinates me uh, and also as a metaphor of us uh, human beings that when we don't have a reference culturally or intellectually we actually can't see you know, we're utterly blind to what we don't know. You know, we're in this extraordinary state of deep ignorance. And then slowly we, we our, our understanding develops and we get some kind of evolution in our consciousness. And then we see, but, but it takes time, you know, we're, we're slow, mm -hmm. we're slow. And so, I feel like at the moment, yeah, the scales of thought, particularly with Black Lives Matter, that has really woken up a lot of people up. And I, I, I feel that, you know, having, I was saying to you before we press record, that I've been living with my grown up children who haven't lived with us for a good decade and COVID for many reasons has brought them home um, for economic reasons and, uh, also in their view well we're better to be locked down than in a permaculture garden <laughs> it's pretty nice <laughs> so um but but i i've what i've really gained from that is is this intergenerational learning where where having the privilege of spending time with one's children in their 30s who've gone out into the world and have a very different experience of the world to me, I'm in my sixties now. Um, and they've, they've taught me a lot. They've, they've taught me a lot during the Black Lives Matter um, mm. because their upbringing with racism is completely different from mine. I mean, in the fifties, I was born in the late fifties and in the fifties, you had signs in the window in London, no blacks, no Irish. You know, that that was the, the my father gave up his Irish citizenship in, in, in the 60s. It, 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 we, we, we were born into a really racist, divided society. And, and my children are much more, much more conscious around these issues as they are of gender and non-binary people you know they have a much deeper understanding of that those nuances of of culture that i i wasn't brought up to have i mean i was brought up and had to slough off and become aware of so much prejudice and and privilege just as part of my my very uh, privileged education um, and where I was born. So it's been, it's been an interesting period of time the last year or so, yeah. just, just being, being stretched by one's children. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I think the, the whole conversation of, of all, all those issues that, that wonderful, that, and it's so critical for the, the healing of the trauma that mm. needs to happen for us to come together, to move, 
mm. um, on on the urgency that that we're now collectively faced, whether whether we heal that trauma or not, uh, um, mm. and and so on one level, I think all of this is part of the guy and the moon response. It the, the, like the 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 skeletons are falling out of the cupboards or the 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 old pus under the the wounds that haven't healed that just mm. seem to have healed is, is 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 coming out because we've we've grown too accustomed to not um seeing our own privilege but but it can be can for for, for somebody who's happily placed and well it, um privilegedly placed in um exactly the demographic group that um, basically should just shut up and leave the space for other people to have a conversation. Yeah. Um, white, over-educated, over 45. Um, yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Just when all this is, like when, when I feel like I have something to share and, and something to say, my demographic group becomes the one that is an absolute no-no. I, I mean, the amount of, I've had conversations with the UN, the development people um, saying like, sorry, we'd love to work you with you on this, but you're the wrong demographic group. Um, I know. Can't fit you into the program. Got enough of I you know. guys already. Yeah? And great that they're finally at that place. And oh, duh. yeah, interesting for somebody as privileged as me to suddenly be on on that end of of being told no, it's no place for someone like you. Yeah? Uh, it is a very, very difficult time for, uh, yeah, white men. <laughs> I, I do, I do. I, I have long conversations with my my son-in-law, who is a composer and a musician, yeah. and uh, yeah, it, it's very difficult. And of course, we've had, um, besides Black Lives Matter, we've also had. We're, we're also having a big conversation in the UK about. Um, domestic abuse and, and mm -hmm. violence against women, particularly since Sarah Everard was mm -hmm. was murdered um, mm -hmm. recently, uh, and murdered by a police officer, abducted and murdered. So extraordinarily difficult time, and uh, and a big conversation, uh, and women uh, voicing how unsafe they feel in the streets mm. and how they work, walk with keys in their hand as weapons mm. and the fear of the step approaching from behind. And, and all of this is, it, it's, I'm fascinated by, I, I think if we weren't locked down, people would be out socializing, clubbing, hanging out, and there wouldn't be time for this great debate and reflection, mm. but because so many of us are at home uh, and not um, able to socialize, um, it, it, it's amplifying the, mm. the um, debates and these tr trigger points. So uh, when something happens that's obviously very tragic, uh, these, this is all being amplified and and people are feeling it very very deeply um so there is in in the uk at the moment big conversations about domestic abuse because the, the there's been a huge upsurge in it um and all, and big conversations of the role of women and that women are still discriminated against. Women often end their working life with at least a third to two thirds less of a pension than men uh, in, in the UK. We have one of the lowest, I think we have almost the lowest child poverty rate in Europe, and yet we're one of the most richest European countries. I mean, it, it's a very interesting place at the at the moment, the UK. It's very it's very divided, and the, and of course there've been, you know, demographically more people of colour have died of COVID than more ethnic minorities in in the UK than, than white people, and, and that's everywhere. But all all of these things you you were mentioning how we 
the landscape's under pressure yeah. because of the changes that our whole world is undergoing. Yeah. And I think society is under pressure and there is more time to actually listen and reflect and educate ourselves about these, these things. And, uh, and I think one, this is one a thing... massive revolution in our consciousness, yeah. COVID. Yeah. I mean, one thing that, that you said earlier before we hit record is that, that it actually had led to more people buying books on um, permanent publication yes. and, and so on. It jolly well has. And, and, and people watch, there, there are more webinars on interesting topics, yeah. there are more yeah. um, groups coming together, sitting in circle, even if it is on a, on a Zoom call um, rather than a real circle. And I, I, I find it, it's making us more international. Like I was just invited to a, a little gig um on on Thursday Thursday and um the person organizing it had asked a friend in Argentina to play the hang drum for the first two minutes of the webinar and and the the, the way that Argentinian was woven into this circle of people mainly calling in from Europe wouldn't have happened be before that you, you wouldn't have come over from Argentina to do a two minute hang drum session but so so yeah it's but but yet, briefly back to what you were mentioning earlier, the, 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 for me, that was here in Spain where we experienced one of the hardest lockdowns um, compared to what the Northern European lockdowns were like um, in, in the first 51 days, like complete house arrest, have mm. to stay inside. During that time, that was the bit that, that, that just killed me every time I connected with it, that what was going on behind closed doors in overcrowded inner city apartments in Spain with um, macho ibericos, like, like Spanish temperamental, slightly ag aggressive males that have lost their job, all their security, all their meaning, all their pressure valves of going to the gym or hanging out with friends and getting drunk, all the horrible practices, whatever. And then being at home with, with a family that too many people in too small of a place. The the horror scenarios that that must have gone on behind closed doors and and, and that made made me feel always sort of again connecting into my privilege of yes it felt horrible to be under house arrest and and have the Mediterranean fifty meters down the road and not be able to go and breathe that air like mm -hmm. um, I mean it felt like a police state and everything but mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you know, Starhawk said something to me a few years ago, and it, it really went in. And, you know, I said to her, what, what do you do about being privileged? You know, she said, yeah. well, you have to be grateful. Absolutely. You have to recognise your privilege and, and really expre express the gratitude. Mm. Thank you. That, thank you, you for saying that. Because be I'm ashamed and yeah. guilty. You have to just say, yeah, I am so lucky. My God, I'm so lucky. But then, and, one and step also, further, I think it's like for me, I've taken it to the step of for me, privilege gives you responsibility to use absolutely, it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, so, because it's powerful if mm. you speak up about your own privilege. It's powerful if you use it to for the healing yeah and that that's what i'm the, the, at least that's what i'm trying to do because what, what are you going to do like it's not going to change the world if i try to divest myself of my privilege there's certain things you can like you can give the last like the money you have away yeah but but you can't give being white having a german passport having three um academic degrees and the curriculum away uh, you can either use it positively or feel so humbled by that privilege to say, okay, then who am I to do anything? But but then you're actually in a self-absorbed living your own privilege, well, living your exactly. own wounds. That doesn't help anybody. No. No, so we 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 take our wounds and like Chiron, yeah. um the the mythical uh, god, we transform them into service for the benefit of everyone else mm. that's what we have to do and uh we take the deep gratitude of priv privilege and we create reciprocity as best we can and we also know that we can never fully see 
our, our privilege and that it's lifelong learning. Yeah, and, that's and, the, um, and, and that's how you stay humble because you know that you don't, you, you still don't have full consciousness and there's still so much to learn. Yeah. And, and I think for me, the last year has been, I mentioned the intergenerational, intergenerational opportunity of learning with my children, which I feel so grateful for. But, but the last year has been a real deep learning. It's a bit like an enforced retreat where we've had to really face some stuff. Um, and but but also celebrate and be so grateful for what we have and and it's been an interesting time of growth and and yeah. yes like you i've sat in circles still and i've i've created uh, as resilient and balanced a life as i possibly can whilst working harder than i ever have because more people have come to see the fragility of clubbing and consumerism and and they want something more in life and i think what we do in our publishing of books and magazines and you were talking about youtube i mean we've had four and a half million hits on our youtube channel wow magazine. you know it's been yeah. it's been a something we've almost prepared for for 30 years and then suddenly we're here and mm. suddenly it, it you know, we've had a, a best-selling book that we sold the first print run in six days. We've never done anything like that. Which book was that? Which book was it? Yeah, um, I'll show you. It's a story, and it's it's about it's called Grounded, and it's it's a, a gardener's journey to abundance and self-sufficiency. And basically, Liz um, was very, very, very unwell. Um, so much so she had to walk with sticks. So she'd kind of struggle with a wheelbarrow with her sticks around her garden. And she built this, she made this beautiful garden that's as much habitat as it is food. And it's got areas of food forest and flowers and then lots and lots of raised beds, no dig, um, vegetable garden. And she sort of went from a, a compacted field uh, to this abundant system that makes her and her partner 85% totally self-sufficient in food all year, which is very clever, a lot of, you know, a lot of preserving. Um, but also she has a little community supported ag agriculture veggie box system as well. So Lovely. she's sharing it with other people. And, and this was, you know, having had a bit of a, a veggie patch, but nothing serious, they moved to a small holding and and she just put all of her energy into this and to grow food because she couldn't work and then found that it was succeeding well and the soil was coming back into heart and and this was all without m much money because her husband's a um doesn't have a executive job and she wasn't working because she was unwell and as she restored this land and brought it into diversity and good heart her her physical oh, illness yeah. receded so it's wow. a, it's it's a kind of hybrid it's not a gar it is a gardening book <laughs> but it's actually about gardening her, herself yeah. Yeah. um and I, I, it's just caught the imagination of people and they're deep you know what else do you do when you're stuck at home well wow. You grow things if you've got a garden. Yeah, no, so much that that's happened and all over, like even people on their balconies. I I, I grew stuff on my balcony. Yeah, just yeah, I was watching you. Know, on. Connection to, to yeah. To, yeah, but how like how has your journey been with the the plot that you you've got one of the oldest um, food forest systems yeah. in in England under yeah. under your is, custodianship. Yeah. Um, when when did you start that system and and how has it evolved and um, how, how do you cope with the abundance in terms of how do you <laughs> share it with other people? Yeah. So um, we, I mean, I think we got the land and as I it was drenched in chemicals and it was just ploughed 
uh, mm -hmm. in about 1992, 93. Mm -hmm. So the first year or more was about very much because it was bare soil, putting a skin on it, put, getting the wildflowers in and planting um, windbreaks, which were all native species tree. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the year after that, we began trying to establish fruit trees, but it was very, very difficult because there's no fertility, a uh, lot, no, no windbreaks and um, just no, the soil was, had nothing. There were no, there were no, there was no soil life at all. It, it had been plowed for years and years and where we live is on, on chalk downland. So you, you scratch below the surface and you find flint and chalk. There's, the subsoil is really, the topsoil is almost non-existent. It, it had blown away years ago and the subsoil was, was very, small you dig down just a little bit and it's pure chalk white um so it took it took quite a lot of many quite a few years to get it established but as soon as we had windbreaks and the wildflower meadows just started to really hold the place together and bring in the the birds and the insects we've never had coddling moth in our apple trees mm -hmm. for instance because we have bats and, and birds and they catch them. Um, and we have, we now have um, lizards, which are uh, called common lizards, but they're not common where we live in Hampshire. We're just outside the, the Portsmouth sprawl, uh, big city sprawl on, on the hills. And yeah, we, we have, a, I mean, when all, all the kids came to, home for the lockdown, so there was five of us living here and so Tim and I just got seriously planting and, and our son-in-law got seriously moving so compost and manure around for us. He was our, he was our, our donkey, <laughs> his nickname is Big Donkey because he's very he's six foot four and he's, he's a tough guy. So he was invaluable physical assistance. Um, and we just got into growing, we grew, yeah, we we re, we grew for the family of five, not for two of us, nice. um, for that year. And uh, now we give away. Um, we, we could sell much yeah. more of our produce, yeah. but we're so busy publishing, we don't really have yeah. time for that. Yeah. So, so it's we. It's very time sensitive, unless unless you. Yeah. Um, I mean, I always regarded it as my pension, actually. Mm -hmm. my, my my food forest was my pension so that you know when i'm a, when i'm a, no longer p publishing five or six days a week i'll be out there picking all and preserving all the harvests and and not going shopping yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what I, I i have to really remind myself not to disappear into being on the land like i i would so love to spend the next three four years just self-sufficiency gardening <laughs> yeah and, and and working on that but yeah. it'll, be, it'll be both and I'll, I'll definitely do yeah. a bit of that uh, yeah so yeah we give it away outside the house I do mm. sell my honey mm. um and we had bumper on honey crops last year just That's we just enough. had so much honey um so, uh, and I'm not allowed to have any more colonies of bees I'm, I've got five now and that's quite enough for mm. the size of the garden so I will be catching swarms but I will be giving them away yeah. <laughs> and I have I before we started talking I made it all sorts of lists of what I wanted to talk about now we talked about so many wonderful things and important things um that I, I'll read a couple of things and you can go where where you would like to go because we have so many connection points like we have the the whole um work with guy education you were there in the early geese developing the curriculum yeah. and, and so on sitting in and, and in then that link, thailand yeah exactly the, the 2007 we spent time in thailand together yeah. at the geese yeah. meeting and um and then the whole eco village connection that brings of course yeah. um but then more recently we had this wonderful opportunity to work together with um that initiative in the commonwealth secretariat yeah. and um mm -hmm. and with, with roller from clubbird first foundation and yeah. you, you're still a trustee of um, common earth 
as well? I am. I yeah. am. Yes. Yeah. I'm. I'm still involved. And, um, and then, and then there's another connection, which is the ELC and the Ecosystems Restoration Camp Advisory yeah. Council, where we're both yeah. at. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, so we we could we could literally go um, anywhere there or somewhere else. Um, but it's about twenty five years, isn't it? Yeah. Of, of um, and you organised the first um, gathering yeah. of pioneers in Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Which All was, those it was so lovely with you you and Tim coming up to uh, speak in, in Findhorn. It was such a privilege. Yeah. It was really amazing. But but yeah, it, it made me feel joyous when we were at um, Marlborough House, which is really a palace of mm -hmm. Duke of Wellington um, in, in London at the Secretariat. And we looked around and there was May East and Christopher Nesbitt and you and me and, and Tim and Albert and, yeah. you know, there were all these, these kind of eco-village permaculture pioneers who, yeah. and we'd all been so, um, particularly in the 90s, so out on the edge that mo a lot of people didn't really even know what we were talking about. Um, it, it, it's, and then there we were in, in what is the British establishment, yeah. although it's not because dear um, Baroness Scotland could never be establishment. Um, but there we were in this palace talking about all the things that we've held so dear as values and um, meeting some wonderful uh, leaders from their own community in those gatherings as well because you know the primary principle is is not to colonize intellectually regenerative development but actually to seed local leadership um, from their own communities and that to me is like absolutely prime directive fundamental principle of that work yeah. um, it, otherwise it, it's just another it's, it's such it's a another, it's such a difficult institution like on the one hand it's a wonderful institution a small set of 54 nations that that can yeah. come together to to agree upon something to then influence the other 198 nations at the un table um, but the history is bizarre, like to have basically the former oppressor and the, all the former oppressed form a club together to celebrate their common heritage in a shared school and legal system that has been enforced upon 50, 53 of them. It's, it's, it, it, it doesn't, but, but it's precisely the kind of bizarre healing um, paradox that that yeah. we need to in, engage upon and see the humanness and the intent and the integrity of the yeah. people working on on all, either side of these bridges uh, that the, 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 these chasms that we still need to heal. Like I, I, it, it reminds me of a, another question that I had on the tip of my tongue for the last 20, 30 minutes. Thinking in your journey, like this dynamic of how do we work as true bridge builders between like we've we've both had our sh share of kind of woolly socks hippie like activism <laughs> and also a bit of anti like it's them it's the yeah. establishment and all that and we've we've all gone on a journey with that and yeah. found ourselves in yeah. Situations well, where I have the picture of you sitting next to the guy who wrote most of the trade regulations of the World Health Organization. I kind of go, how do I get this picture? You, you posted that on Facebook, and I was kind of like, oh, Daniel, okay, I'll be present to this moment. Yeah. But, but no, yeah, sitting but it, next to Mr. World Trade Organization. Um, yeah. How do I we? Think... How do you find that dance between? Okay. Like, you were speaking to it earlier when you were speaking about the role of, like us working in as as. We have to find our humanity. Like, like, the, the animals in farming yeah. and animals in landscape yeah. and the human role of yeah. keeping populations down. Yeah. That means killing animals, and and it's such a difficult line on the ethics of all of this. And how how do we hold the bridge between our mm -hmm. highest ideals and what's actually going to get us 
there and how and yeah it's very difficult but yeah i think you i think i mean the reason why Rola and I actually became friends was because I actually at the first Commonwealth uh, com convening I actually was quite angry because there was a, a, a civil a very high up civil servant from the COP negotiations mm -hmm. who was working on behalf of the UK government he was so utterly cynical and so utterly not engaged in climate change and and i just said to rola this is never going to work mm -hmm. and she said i will prove to you that we're going to do something here mm -hmm. you stick with me i'll prove it to you maddie mm -hmm. and i think because i spoke my truth to her she instantly trusted me because often in those kind of environments everyone's trying to climb up the career pole of greasy consultancy and you know get the gig and and actually I I was saying no I don't think this is going to work I don't think this is good um so we started this relationship how do I deal with I I think we have to just like we we have these this full separation between us and nature and we think we, we have this sense of alienation and not being part of the unity. We do that with people as well. And fundamentally, if I sit next to someone who's written the contracts for the uh, World Trade Organization, what do I do? I have a tendency to be quite interested. Uh, and that particular person really likes Kate Raworth's work, Donna economics and says that's the way forward so he's obviously had a, a growth moment where he's seen that perhaps his previous career wasn't how it should be and that we should be looking at economics from a totally different perspective so i try and find those points of commonality and connection rather than always be seeking dis disconnect mm -hmm. And of course, when you're with, if you're with sociopaths and psychopaths, it's better not to try and do that. Mm. And there are some genuinely evil people in this mm. world who really are unredeemably evil. And, mm. and let's not be naive that, that everyone can be healed because some people just can't mm. for whatever reason. It's kind of zero zero point five percent or something of the. It's very and small. So we're talking, and then, talking one in two hundred. Um, I mean, they do end up as presidents and, and leaders because they tend to like <laughs> use use their skills. Fortunately, they have yeah. to go and live in Florida in the end. Yeah. Um, yeah. But in the main, yeah, the the nine hundred the one hundred and ninety nine people who might not have the same share the same views or perspective or maybe a little bit slower yeah. in understanding yeah. you know the challenges of climate change racism i mean i personally believe that our how we treat our land is how is indicative of how we treat each other yeah. and and all of these things um, all of the cruelty that we uh, suffer in the world, human to human, is, is replicated in what we do to nature. Yeah. And that it's all part of this lack of consciousness. And that, that most people are just, you know, they're waking up to it. And people have different rates of, of awakening. And for some reason, I don't think I'm a particularly brilliant or talented person, but for some reason, I've just had life experiences that, that shook me awake um, to some of the issues of our time. So climate change as a reality to me was very real, very, well, you know, 30 years ago. I was writing about it in I, I gave talks at school. I gave talks at school. I yeah. left school in 1991. Yeah. And in the last three years, I was giving talks on M Amnesty mm -hmm. International and Greenpeace and, and mentioned climate change in the Greenpeace talks. So it, it's not 
it's that recent that we mm. knew about it. Yeah. And, and when I was at university um, 40 odd years ago, I, I was studying um, the great black writers of, of you know, American literature mm. and stories of the Trail of Tears and and, you know, because my degree was not just European literature, but it was American history and literature as well. I, I had this for 40 years ago, it was incredibly forward thinking American professor who was teaching me about what happened to um, the Native American people in 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 the States. And, and that kind of then and also I studied European history. Um, and the Irish question, as it was called, um, and my father, my grandparents were Irish. So I think I was lucky in a way to have, and my maternal grandmother was Anglo-Indian and had had, had had to leave India for, because she was so discriminated. All, all the family left and lived in Paris and, and in Europe because it was, much more freer there for um, someone who was not within the caste system in India in pre First World War. So I think all of these influences came to me and, and I think I was just very lucky to, to have those, those potential spaces to learn and, and to, and I have to pay tribute to Tim that it was really Tim who got permaculture before I did. You know, I was a bit too much of an urban Easter to really get it. Um, but it, it, the light bulb went on for him and he became, he, could, he got the vision, you know, almost instantaneously. It took me ooh, quite a few months to, to really get, get where he was. I was quite cross at the time, actually, because it was a, such a pattern disruptor. Yeah. You know, here I was, I'd had a kid and I was pregnant. And I was going along in this world, doing my conservation and saving frogs and things. And then suddenly the, the whole of life blew up and, and it was going and, to uh, change forever. I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned Tim because I, I, for me, the two of you, I'm sure that the inside story is, is has has its own ups and downs and so on, but but from from the outside, um, your real example of how wonderful it can be if um, if the male and the female parts of us meet and honor each other and support each other and hold each other and give both people equal space to grow. And I, I don't know, I just just perceive you always from the outside as a, as a really wonderful couple to, to um, emulate in, in terms of that's, that's a good relationship, well lived. Yeah. Well, he is my beloved. Yeah. <laughs> but yes, I mean, obviously in, there is, you know, there are many stories which are mm. not as gilded, but yeah. you know, we, we still do our own personal work. We still, we meet, we have a, a, a circle of two every month where we meet Lovely. and we have a practice, which is about around um, communication and, and just dropping all the masks and speaking about what matters in, a, in an uninterrupted space. And we make time for that every mm. month. And, and we do, we try, we try to be kind to each other. Um, Tim's a very kind man. Um, I, one of my ongoing pieces of work is around kindness. Mm. Um, from, you know, working on myself. Um, and it's something that, yeah, I, I really believe in that we, ne we never come to the end of, you know, people talk about elders and they talk about me as a, a permaculture leader and elder, you know, age 62, as if that's like grandmother status is way, no. And my experience of life is, is that, yeah, we have to, you know, as your body gets older, your muscles become 
tighter and you're less supple and you need to do your practice so uh, I have to do my yoga I have to do my exercises I have to do my five kilometer or more walks every week a few times a week you know I have to keep this body uh, you've been out paddle boarding good for you I'm useless at paddle boarding I wobble too much but um just as you have to keep your physical body well if you are going to really be in service to this world then we need to keep we need to be as healthy as we can be um and we need to be emotionally as as well as we can be and and mentally as well so yeah we're st we're still working on ourselves and i i don't really want to stop you know if i make it into my 80s and i still have to go and have some counseling over stuff then i'm happy to do that and i sit in the women's circle of <coughs> excuse me uh 12 wonderful women from their later 80s down to their 40s um, I'd, I'd like there to be some younger women and hopefully we'll be able to nurture that as time goes on but we used to meet three times a year in person now we're not able to so we meet every month on zoom excuse me <coughs> and and we have to lay ourselves bare and show up and be authentic and and face our our own challenges and our own the darkness of our own psyche so I'm I'm really up for that I mean in my 20s I trained as a psychotherapist and I gave that up and got into this other form of healing but I'm still really up for that I think that's that is at the essence a good probably a good way, place to end for us um so we don't have too long of a conversation <laughs> that nobody wants to listen to but um but if to me you describe this willingness to give up who you are for what you could become or be constantly in 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 a state of understanding that the learning never stops that there isn't there isn't an arrival that the journey is what counts and i i always um call it the practice of tugging on one's mask um like the the, the sort of and i i think sometimes i've disabled myself by maybe doing it too much but but it's it is an important practice to never forget to do um regularly uh, of of just saying am i just bullshitting myself or wh like what's what's actually behind this like um how comfortable is that for you like and, and like pushing the edges where where we where we also do the things that that need commitment and long-term commitment to 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 transform ourselves and um, and that's at the heart why working regeneratively is different from from kind of a sort of understanding of sustainability that that um paints a picture of the perfect place where we will arrive shows you the blu blueprint of say says look this is how it has to be um it's we'll never get there we'll we'll always both both internally as a community as couples as human beings as life um the whole point is the journey and the transformation and and if we do it like that then we will stay dynamically humble because mm -hmm. we will always be in a state of growth and change mm -hmm. and it, we won't be stagnant and there will always be new learnings and we'll always be trying to expand and and tug at the mask but we have to tug at the mask with a certain amount of compassion for ourselves knowing that we're just not perfect and we never will be well thank you so much for this time together and and i hope that the world spins in ways that well it's been about 21 years um that in a, that we get another 21 years to, to look so. back at the, that story and maybe even look back at this conversation and say how have <laughs> we how have we changed so give my give my love to tim and thank you so much for this time together thank you very much daniel it's been a lovely conversation mm. i've enjoyed it thoroughly me too bye bye, bye.